Hello, Jesus. How are you doing? Hi, Roberto. Very good to see you. Thank you for your invitation. Oh, thank you for taking the time. So, would you like to share with you, with us, what you're doing right now? Yes. Um, that's a very interesting question because I, in the past, I will, I will say that I will connect myself for what, who I am for what I'm doing. Now, I don't know what I'm doing, so I don't know who I am <laughs> or what I am. Uh, but I can tell you that I'm Colombian. I was born in Bogota. I went to law school, philosophy, then to theater. Then by, um, I graduated as an actor and I started working uh, doing theater at the Teatro Libre. Um, then with the time, I decided to move to the United States. I thought I was going to just stay here for a very short period of time and to learn English. I was 30 years old at the time. I didn't speak any English. Uh, I always joke around, but it's true. Like, the only things I knew was like the colors and fruits and the following movies, where they are, something like that. That was the only English I knew. <laughs> uh, six months later, I started believing in the country. I, I started experiencing something very interesting that it was kind of the process of becoming an immigrant. In Colombia, I had the blessing of going to very good uh, institutions to study. Like I went to Universidad del Rosario to study law. I studied music, and so I came here, and just the fact that I couldn't talk, I couldn't express myself, then I was being treated different. This is beyond uh, the sense that we know, the political and social sense of racism and all of that. I mentioned this to you because you really hate my identity of who I am, and then suddenly not be able to communicate really put me in a perspective. So I, I see my other friends doing it. I had uh, my closest friends, of one from Africa and the other from Japan. We were once in a small restaurant um, in York, Pennsylvania, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, when I saw a cross of, we were probably a very funny bunch to see, and I saw across the table, it was another table of some ladies who were laughing at us. Um, and again, I couldn't communicate. So for six months, that really stuck with me, and I wrote a play about immigration. What is the difference? to be a Latino, what is the difference between Colombia, Venezuela, etc. We are not the same. It seems if I am in Miami, everybody assumes I'm Cuban. If I am in New York, everybody assumes I'm Puerto Rican or Dominican or Mexican if I am here in the West. So that play went very well. We got us a few grants. With that, I traveled to, I went to New York, to the School of Russian Theater. Um, from the, after New York, we went to Miami. Uh, the Playground Theater invited me to be part of that. I went to the Grotowski Institute, the Work Center at Josie Grotowski, the Odin Theater for years. That is when we have some of our mutual friends. Um, so every, all this time I was doing a very search in theater. And theater is, and theater is where I breathe and I still feel that way. By 2012, something started changing in me, or the need of changing, and I actually started in Zizinka. I was talking to a friend of mine about it yesterday. Brzezinka was the place of the Paratheater of Jerzy Grotowski in Poland. Um, something stopped satisfying me and I make a big change. I, until yesterday, I realized that I moved from Miami to Montana to work in a therapeutic boarding school, almost like recreating Brzezinka for me, like going to the forest to try to figure out what, it, what am I. For my surprise, and at the beginning, when I start working in the therapeutic boarding school with adolescents who has uh, very difficult stories of mental health or trauma or, or difficulties uh, in life in general, um, first I tried to approach it how I knew it, that it was like a theater director. So I tried to you know, do Hamlet and try to do a Hamlet with the kids, a Hamlet that Shakespeare will be happy, um, a training, and then I try a training that maybe. Yeah, Stanievsky will be happy, uh, or Grotowski. And, and then he noticed that uh, I was not be able to engage with the kids. And then, then, I'm, then there was a moment that I thought, okay, this is not working. And this is not working because what I did, now I can see, but at that moment, I couldn't see. I was bringing my ego or my director. I'm going to impose this here, and I'm going to teach these kids that instead of listening. So there is a moment that I thought, like, you know, I am trying to get the validation of all these dead people. I want Chekhov to be happy. I'm going to try to listen to the kids. 
So I start working with the kids and then I start working their stories. And then suddenly the work uh, gained relevance. It was for me like the first time that I saw the power of using the, 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 um, the elements or the tools of the performing arts applied to a person. And I know that we have, um, you know, like drama, uh, therapy, we, we already have, we know already that the, the, the arts carry a therapeutic component. But for me, in my investigation, was well, the first time that I see how far it can go, because it's different to teach to a kid who is in the position of wanting to be helped, uh, I'm in the position of don't want it to be helped. So this, since 2012, then I moved from Montana to North Idaho, where I am right now in Coeur to work in another, in another therapeutic residential uh, center. In both places, I, with years, after becoming the, the teacher, the theater teacher, I also become director of the program. I manage the program and then I start directing the programs. When I'm directing the programs, I start working with a wonderful team of people from program staff, people from different backgrounds that then suddenly find themselves working in, the, in a mental, mental health uh, program. I get the chance to work with nurses and therapists and psychiatrists and doctors. And it's an understanding to all that component. And still, for me, in my mind, I keep doing theater. And this is now a theater applied directly to the treatment plans. Um, by the beginning of this year, uh, I decided after uh, years in, in, in this work, I talked to the company where I was working and I say that, I think it's time for me to come back closer to Latin America, closer to the culture. One of the things that I've seen also is like mental health, and this is if you wish, of course, we can talk a little bit longer about this. But mental health, we're still in the uh, beginning steps of this. Um, I don't think that one of the biggest things is the stigma. Um, for Even when I talk to people that I consider and they are very knowledgeable, very humans, you know, that interest in the humanity, I still hearing how we refer to those people who has problems. And we don't see mental health as, uh, as something that concerns all of us. We're still, and, and this is across the, con the country and the world. I mean, there is places that are even behind that. We're still having madhouses and somebody who, who is uh, not aligned with whatever, standard mental health is in a place it's just segregated so if you ask me what i am right now i can tell you i am a crossroad because before i tried to figure out who i am and i thought i am one now i believe that i uh, we are you are everybody is and i am a multiplicity of beings i think that we are in relationship with others um, I think the coronavirus is showing how little we actually can control our destiny, our fate. Um, we, can, we can definitely decide how we're going to respond to it, but we cannot plan because the forms of the world change. Um, I'm very interested in mental health. I'm very interested in the development of the human that seems to be a stop in, in adolescence. It's kind of like with my young adults. It is like we always spend a lot of time talking about the kids, the baby. Then when you hit 20, 25, 30, you're on your own. You just figure out. You're supposed to know what it's to do. So I am in a crossroad. I am in a crossroad to my artistic career. I'm in a crossroad in my professional career as a program director. I'm in a crossroad being in North Idaho and getting ready to drive all the way to Miami. Um, and that is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable, but at the same time, that is bringing me the, the possibility of the space of start thinking, who, who am I? And, and what, what, which direction I'm gonna take? And maybe all of them, I don't know. Uh, so we, you seem to be exactly where many of us are in this moment, at a crossroad. Uh, I don't know if you had the chance to listen to uh, and watch Eugenio Barba talking about um, Sposare la maschera, marry the mask, when he talks about all the earthquakes that um, he imposed to the company, and each time that there was this moment of crisis, um, the company and his work 
was regenerated, took new directions. So it seems that we are all in this moment where we, there, where there is a narrative where we want to go back to the normal, but that normal doesn't exist anymore. Sorry. And probably we, sh we don't want to go back to that normal that has failed us. So I wanted to talk to you because I know of your work and how already you are using theater and performance because it's not only theater, you use also dance, you use also music okay. as a tool to, um, you said theater applied directly to a treatment plan, but uh, really here you're using performance um, as a tool to create, sorry, please. Of healing. A tool of healing. So, in this moment, performance, the artist, and I don't want to talk just uh, about the art. Uh, we often talk about the art, but I think we need to talk about the artists in this moment, because we create the art. We are instrument, a tool for healing in this, uh, during these times. So, yes. There is two things when I, when I hear you saying that, um, one of them, is like the artist or we are going to be feeling it the hardest so the, the the very difficult task for us right now is like the people who feel the hardest the pain the transformation the deaths are also the people who are responsible to respond to it it is um almost if you see it as a a doctor or a nurse who is in the er and then you find yourself in a situation so many of my fellow artists are uh, we are going through a very difficult time and and the, and the thing is at the same time that we're going through it we do have the responsibility to respond to it and how to respond to it and that's kind of like the second thing uh, that i'm being finding through my conversations also with some of the fellow directors that i have and it's like um i think i i am the last generation of those who as an artist we grow with the idea of masters we look up to like Eugenio Barba, again, Jerzy Grotowski, and if you wanna go back, we go to Stanislavski, Meyerhoff, and this idea of a master. This idea of a master, I, at least for me, I, I can talk from my experience, gave me kind of like the, the, a checklist, right? So um, then I would say, okay, Grotowski talk about organicity this way, Meyerhoff talks about organicity that way, and then I find my way into trying to find out what the organicity means. But it's always come kind of like looking at it as a master. And I think that we are finding right now that the generations after us and the war itself now calls for a very strong step. And is we are now masters of our own work. And then when we do that, or when I, at the beginning, what I was facing my students, and one thing is to teach or to try to lead an improv, improv game with two regular or normal or standard, whatever you want to say, it, uh, person. And another thing is to try to lead an improv with somebody who is actively hearing voices. Or you can sing, you can teach singing, and, and you pointed very well about the performing arts. You can start singing with an actor who wants to sing, to become a singer or a, in, a mu in a musical. You can also work with an, a performer who wants to sing because wants to understand the voice and all of that. And also, you can also to sing with somebody who is so desperate trying to kill themselves that you don't know if this is gonna be the last opportunity you're gonna see this person, and this is, could might be the last song. So when I find myself in that situation of life and death, um, then um, I am just worried about the person that is in front of me. But I, don't, I do not have a master that I can follow. I don't have a book. I don't have, I don't have nothing to, to follow. So I think that in that lack of mastery, in all of us we are, I see some of my artists are trying to feed into the little box of Zoom, their art. And as you pointed very well, there is no normality. This is, this is what we are right now. So what is the role? Um, I think the role is connection. And then maybe it's time for us to reevaluate what we thought about the performing in terms of 500 people in a, in a building. We might come back to that. We may not. But I think that the power that we have is now a power 
one and one, empower on myself without a master in on me. So, it has been uh, speaking of masters has been uh, very illuminating for me to talking directly to the uh, to the artists because of course we can read articles we can read about how the artists feel but until you talk directly to the artist you don't know exactly what happens and what has been illuminating to me that every artist that I've talked to so far they are in our situation they are locked in the house they are training themselves. They, their narrative is, okay, now I have the time to learn or to work on my physicality, or to work on, the, on my voice, or to work on a new project. But this idea of training, to, of becoming better. And these are also artists that are the first ones that have been um, um, abused in a way by the coronavirus because they lost all the projects, many of them have, have lost their income. So uh, uh, there is a, a form of uh, discrimination here that I want to talk about. That's why our project is called Performing Human Rights. In at times we forget that the artists are human and they have their rights. And they never get back what they put into the community. So with the, with the artists that are training themselves. I was making the point with uh, Pino di Budo that, uh, well, we, there are some masters that we need to look up to, right? And uh, if, uh, if uh, the artists and are training themselves, and as you said, are becoming masters themselves, there, there is still the need to have um, a confrontation with that, uh, with the, with the master and, uh, and to, to also continue this di dialectic of grow, growth. Uh, so I, I think that um, what you said is uh, just exciting and uh, it, it is important because then the challenge becomes, well, how much can we work and improve ourselves if we do this in solitude? But you have the answer, well, the connection with the others. There is a, a, a couple of points that you, you made that they are very important. One of them is the sociological and political. The artists are hitting the most. I also know because of the fact that, of course, the, I mean, there is no theaters, there is no venue. And we are parents. We, I have daughters. I have, so we always are used to, to the survival kind of game. Always, this is kind of like part of the, seems to be part of the, of the artistry. <laughs> is try to figure out artistic and different ways to be able to survive. So there is a concern about money. There is a concern about health. An artist cannot easily take care of himself. Uh, going, might not have health insurance. So we, we have all this concrete part that uh, for us is always been a challenge and now it's even more challenging. I just want to mention that because sometimes it really gets difficult to wake up in the morning and believe, oh, today I'm going to work on myself. Again, I'm talking about myself. Oh, I'm going to move on. I'm going to do a video. I'm going to talk about the voice. I'm, I'm going to meet with Roberto today when if I have also the concern in my mind, yeah, but I need to put food on the table for my daughters or I need also to figure out, you know, oh, I, I have this pain in my knee. Of course, I cannot go to a doctor right now, but even if I could, I don't have the way to afford it. Artists, um, we always belong to like a, another category of the human beings. I was talking to Raul Yaisa, director of the theater director, Argentina and Italian, and close collaborator of Eugenio. And it's almost like we belong to a different country. Our nationality is the stage. Our nationality is the working space. Our nationality is a, our language is the language of the artistic work um, because we are like the, that. And so I don't want to go, go too long at that point, but it, 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 is, it is a reality that if we are going to be talking about artists uh, trying to figure out themselves at home, there is that big heaviness of concern about, yes, and how can I make ends meet at the end of the day? That exists, is real, and is there, and we will have to figure out, and we will figure out. So I'm, I'm very appreciative of your efforts right now um, to, to bring the attention and to focus into this. Uh, regarding the becoming us, becoming the work at home, I see it, uh, my upbringing in Colombia, of course, is Catholic. 
Uh, so the metaphors that sometimes I use to kind of understand what I am has to do with the ritualism. Um, and I see ourselves in the whole thing about master or no master. It's like right now our master is a pandemic that is going across the world, which says, oh, you thought you had a show? You don't have a show anymore. Or you thought that you're going to see your family? You're not going to see your family anymore. And in some way, like after Eve and um, Eve buy the apple and go kicked out and there is not a God and then there is a place out there, we, we're going to be that. We're going to be feeling in a moment in like there is not a God, a master to follow. Of course, there is the books and there's things to do, but there is a reality. And then all the, the rules have changed. So how to believe in ourselves? how to continue working, how to think that there is a, a positive future or not for what we are doing. The only result that I have found is like, there is no way for me to figure that out. <laughs> I just figure out my now, my here. So what are the tools around me? And I think that what you are mentioning, and I see some of the interviews is very accurate. My reality is my house. Okay, that's my environment. And what are the, how is my relationship with the objects? How is relationship with myself? So we are not going to be able to prepare to a future that we have no idea what it is. And to keep worry about it, just will increase anxiety. I think that the now is what we have. And, and how we respond to the now, that's, that's the only clue uh, that I've seen is, is working in my case. What, uh, what I have discovered in this, uh, during this um, month of, uh, not two months of, um, a quarantine and uh, I was in Italy uh, when uh, Italy locked down and I was uh, able to escape from Italy on March 15th because I, I am also an American citizen <clears throat> and I was able to come back home uh, and um, has been obviously a very challenging time and I was in Italy because this project performing human rights was supposed to be a project dealing with immigration. So we were to do using the techniques uh, uh, of Theater for Social Change and uh, Augusto Boal, we were to, uh, with uh, my colleagues uh, uh, at Trinity University and with students, we were to do uh, ex um, interview people, uh, immigrants in San Antonio. You know, San Antonio is a crossroad mm -hmm. uh, uh, being so close to the Mexican border and then create a forum project there and then go to Sicily and do the same with the uh, African uh, immigrant wow. coming and then have a comparison, a comparative uh, exchange uh, because members of the team are uh, experts in human rights and, the commu and, and communications. Uh, so we wanted this idea of using the, uh, the art and the artist as a tool for uh, 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 social change. And uh, when I started these interviews, I wanted to focus still on these um, uh, populations that are at risk, like the immigrants, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that were, and, uh, and I wanted to focus on how the governments were, was dealing, or every government was dealing with the crisis of coronavirus and whether in their dealing they were, uh, um, they were uh, putting at risk the life of people, right? Mm -hmm. So violating some basic, uh, specific human rights. But as I was working, I, I realized that I did, we, don't, we did not have artists to go on the ground or to tell those stories, the stories that we tell as artists, because we never do art for art's sake. No, we, do, we also do that because we need to do that. It's part of uh, growing the craft, right? But most of the work that the artists, performers do, have a connection as a response with the society, with the community. And to point out something that we as a community have to pay attention to. So my, the, proce uh, the process has and um, the project in a way has changed, shifted, when I start to see that the artists, it was evident, after the second interview, if the artists cannot tell their stories, we have a problem right there at the root. Yes, yes. 
You know, in, in America, there is no safety net. In San Antonio, the moment they locked the city, all the funding for the arts was gone midway. So I was thinking, well, this is, a, this is something that, that we need to talk about uh, with the artists. Uh, and that's why it's morphed into the role of the artists and, and how the artists are, are feeling. And because also there is, a, there is a, in the artist, as you said, the artist is a survival. Yep. And now we need, and we survival every time. The artist not only is a survival, but the artist is the, the, is the one that finds solutions. Our art, as you are a director, I am a director, right? And a writer. So when we direct, there is a problem and we always have to figure out how to solve that problem. We yes, yes. Creatively, right? We yes. are, we, every time we create new worlds. Yes. Uh, and that passion, that, that, that passion that you're bringing, that, that, that response that you're having, is exactly the direction that we can take. The artist, we dance over death. For us, there is no death. We are like an Igmat Bergman, you know, in the seventh seal. Uh -huh. We are just figures that will survive. And the past will happen. And we're going to be still laughing. We are the contrast. We are the, 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 the catalyst of life. Right, and because of this talent of the artist, I think that we as artists have to have a, a place in the, around the table of the decision makers. I would love for the mayor of San Antonio, I, I don't know whom is he talking to now, but what if he were to talk and have some artists in his team and have also the feedback of the artist that is used to create, to, 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 uh, to overcome adversities, because that's what our art is, right? Is a crisis after crisis after crisis in the creation moment, right? And if we, if um, the leaders would start to think that it's not just the art, but the ability of the artist to find solutions, and bring that and harvest that ability, I think that uh, we would find new ways of uh, creating a new life, creating a new normal. I hate this word of new normal anyway, but creating a new system that is more centered on nature, more centered on human beings, and less centered on money, right? The, that system broke. The neoliberal system broke, and we don't want to go back there. So that's, that's what I have learned during this uh, um, journey uh, of uh, really kind of the role of the artist as the one that should be part of the solution. I, I totally agree with you. I, and I think that you just um, described what I am feeling in my realm of mental health. This is what I need to jump. Now we need to go out there and who cares if the plastics or, or, are not performed practically. The organically response that we need to have is not a response based of technique, but based in a response of life. So, because for a long time, and, and this idea of mastery that we've been discussing in the past, for me, become a formula of a technique, and then life was taken by technique. Right now, it's like in your desk, everything put aside, and you are facing a, a, a direction, and I agree with you. This is the moment where the artist should not be at home, training, waiting for the moment that everything reopens. That's, no, that's not gonna happen. It shouldn't happen. It should not be the way. This is the moment to go out there, to, hey, Roberto, what are you doing? Look, this is what we're doing. We need to make this presence because we have the responsibility to make the presence. I, I don't know if that play is gonna be the best play or the worst play, but if somebody does something about immigration and put it online, or if somebody is meeting one by one, I have a theater director, is a teacher who was telling me how um, their students, they have 35 students. They are like, oh my God, we need to be resilient. We need to, no, it's not about being resilient. It's not about to like, oh, you know, we go through this tough time. No, the opposite. The tough time require us to respond to it. So instead of having 35 uh, actors in one play, now uh, my friend is thinking to do 35 plays. 
And I'm like, I was saying to my wife, how wonderful it will be if each one of us, we start spreading. Let's use ourselves as a virus, a counter virus, <laughs> and, and a virus that goes in the in. And each one of us, we are going to contact 10 people and we're going to say, hey, we're going to have an hour of theater. And then we're going to talk in your living room and we're going to use your props. And let's talk about what we need. And I, I think that could be the, the, the beginning of a movement, no political movement, but a consciousness movement and a consciousness and awareness, a movement of awareness and consciousness. So I, I applaud very much your efforts and you now you count on me with whatever I can do. I'm no political. Uh, why, why we are so afraid to talk about politics in America? We come from two places where we talk <laughs> politics all the time, right? And we can actually have a conversation about politics with people that uh, may not uh, agree with us without being, you know, labeled uh, socialist, communist, uh, fascist, all that. Um, I find very interesting that um, theater, at least in America, has become, uh, it's not touching politics that much. No. Why? What, what is your, why is that? Uh, because I think it's the same thing how this, I feel that the country as a collective is reacting to the pandemic. When I'm coming from, from Colombia and when we, when we have experienced the whole thing of the war with the traffic of drugs of Pablo Escobar and then the bombs and the violence, that has generated in the collective a different kind of response. Like in Colombia right now, with the with the pandemic, with the virus, there is a day that just women can go, another day that men can go. Like they respond collectively different as we are here. Uh, we traditionally in Colombia have two political parties, conservative, liberal, and conservative. Now we don't. Now we have a bunch, and everybody can create their own and, and present more possibilities. I think that. Um, here, the thing is that I'm political because we are political animals. We, we do uh, relate and our work, uh, honestly, if some director is very important right now to, for us to think is Brecht and Brecht use the tools of theater to educate and to just present his political views too. So I do believe that theater and we as an actor, we do have a political role into this. I guess when I meant in no political, I refer to the standard of cliche of being a Democrat or Republican, and how this stigmatism of whether well, you are a Democrat or, or you are a Republican uh, carries. And especially when we have, I believe, a moment of transformation in the collective of the United States, um, because there is a difference, like there's a difference in the size. The amount of people that we have sick, the amount of people that are dying is extremely different at the rest of the world. It's, it's just in numbers, it's very obvious. So we, there is something that we are not doing, um, I would not say right or wrong, but it's we are not doing according for what we could have done in other places. Um, and when I refer to that political, is to that battle. And I think that the fear is a friend of, a friend of my daughter, our neighbors in by North Idaho is mostly Republican. Uh, and my daughter, who is, uh, she's 15, so she's waking up to her own ideas, independent ideas of whatever she, she believes in feminism, but of course, when I talk to her, she doesn't really have a round understanding. She just standing there. She told me yesterday, oh, I really like the neighbors, but I look through the fence. I do, and do they have a sticker of being Republican? What should I do now? And I'm like, well, you like them, right? <laughs> She's like, yeah, they're super nice, but they have the sticker that is Republican. <clears throat> so I said, but that doesn't mean anything. I mean, at the end, people are people. In one way or another way, if they're Republican or Democrat. So I think there's the, the mental collective fixation of what we have said. Colombians, everybody I go I hear Colombia. Colombian thinks, oh, Colombians are like this, this, like that. So we think Democrats are like this. And we use those kind of concepts, put it on the people to label them, and then it's when the crash happens. The political in the deep sense, in the anthropological sense, is a reality. In the modern times, is a... Um, it's more a reductive way of grouping a group of people. Immigrants, when we talk about immigrants, for example, and you know this very well, uh, immigrants is a term, but really it depends culturally, uh, the immigrants from Honduras that come through Mexico and the, the ones that from Mexico, the Venezuela immigrants that go to Brazil, you know, so it it's really depends on the individuality. But those are those, the two ways that we can see the polit politics. 
I think that's, uh, that's, uh, those are two constructive ways of uh, looking at politics. And, and uh, I feel like that, um, and I'll ask you, um, so if uh, we as artists <clears throat> are to contribute to the, to the creation of a new way of life that is more center on the, on the humans, a new humanism in a way, and nature, shouldn't also be trying to create a new narrative around politics, what politics means. As you said, it's not just being Republican Democrat or Democrat, because it seems to me that one of the benefits of the coronavirus, I'm sorry, there are no benefits, but mm -hmm. one that could be, is that has, uh, has made this division so a little irrelevant. For instance, I can speak actually better about the Italy. In Italy, up to four or five months ago, we have uh, we had uh, a government was mostly from the right, uh, and we have people like Salvini and Meloni that were from the right, really fascist movement. And once the uh, coronavirus hit, um, they seem to become more and more irrelevant. And the more irrelevant they become, at the eyes in the eyes of the people the more radical they become in, uh, in attacking the Pope, attacking uh, more the immigrants, attacking every decision that the government was making. And that was, I find that very interesting, how these divisions um, and how also the divisions within our country and some of the, pol the two political parties seem to become more irrelevant. And they are trying to grasp for, for uh, relevance, but which they have lost. You say, I think that you, the word relevance right now is probably the main word that we just should be using. I think that our art and our practices were becoming irrelevant. Um, we are seen by the world as a form of entertainment and entertaining is not that it's bad, it's just that it's not the only thing that we are. Uh, and entertaining implies the capacity to abstract from my life and just forget about my life and just watch something that entertains me. Can change my focus, so I don't have to think of myself. And if you, if I, or the people that I have talked to, uh, you think you're an actor, they merely, oh, you're an actor in which TV show or and I think that the, we, we, we lose relevance in that way. And uh, I mentioned before Brecht, and I think that that was one of the things that in the, in the way how Brecht was working is that to be able to break that entertainment kind of thing and come back to it. I think that the, the movement right now is to be um, relevant. How to be relevant in times of right now, I, I believe is not to think we are going to create a new way of uh, humanism. I think we are in a new way of humanism. I think it's more to understand the surroundings that we are, because if not, we put our minds into, uh, we fall into the same trap. I was, um, I think it was the, like Water for Chocolate, uh, the book from, that is a movie. I think it was in that movie that I saw as a Mexican, Mexican story. Uh, and it happens in terms of the revolution. And then there was a moment when, you know, it's a love story, but also it's the revolution, the Mexican revolution. And so there is all these two parts, one of parts looking for equality and the other part, the old part of the, of the, the traditional class that is coming from Mexico. But there is one scene that they're talking to a peasant and the guy says, uh, uh, and then the, the revolutionary people arrive and the revolutionary people are expecting the farmer to be happy because they see them and says like, I'm not happy. When the army arrives, took my chickens. When you arrive, you took my chickens. So at the end, when we think about it reactively, then what we become is like part of the same trap. Uh, as you said, then we start ev evilizing everything. Then um, I saw the other day just because he was everywhere and he was, it was very interesting, this documentary, uh, Tiger Lion, no, no, Tiger King, uh, in Netflix, uh -huh. and I saw it when, a few weeks ago, and they showed like, no, 
the, the guy who is making a profit with the tigers, and then there's another lady who is uh, actually defending the tigers. But at the end, the tiger is in the cage. And so in all of these, the tiger is in the cage. So how to be relevant is not to, for me, in my, my point of view, is to see what you can do in the now, in the, in the here right now. Don't think about a con mental construction, or I cannot think in a mental construction. I'm gonna, this happen, but it's never gonna happen. It's here. If my relationships are my neighbor, you and my wife, explore the relationships. What I am in terms of the relationships. Don't put the technique on top of that. How, how I am, oh look, I, my anger got triggered by this. Oh, how can I do the opposite of it? So if we individually use ourselves as a lab for consciousness and awareness, almost like in the reaction of a quantum, quantum physics, because it happens in the, in the quantum physics, um, the reality of the particles in the quantum physics, if you observe them, they don't behave the way. So we are not here observing a reality, responding to a reality. We are in the movement of the reality. So just, I was talking with somebody else says, no, it's time for us. And we were talking, you and I, how to become the master of myself. I have to be careful when I say things like that because it is no me as a master and then myself. I am in relationship with myself. Each one of us are connected, like in the quantum physics uh, in this, uh, research. So in my work, I am working with you. I am working with the students online in theater and things are happening that I never imagined is be able to emotionally connect with the person through the screen. I, when you were talking to me about your passion, I, could, I was be able to feel it. So I think that we are already there. We have a high sensitivity of emotions and thoughts. Let's use it. Let's use it to see the reality, uh, to bring consciousness and awareness. More than, more than counter, more than fighting. It's like a thought. I'm no, I'm, I, mean, I cannot battle a thought with another thought. It just creates anger. I have to have the thought go and I refocus. And with this, uh, with this uh, that you said that we are all connected, we still have the farmer that uh, is not happy because the revolutionary and the counter-revolutionary steals uh, his or her the chickens or the tigers are still in the cage because what the, the tragic aspect of this that I notice is that although these people are becoming more irrelevant, they still have some the remnants of the power of the old system. Oh yes, and oh that, yes. And that's what uh, I think that's where we can act, uh, act of course by voting, of course, of but course. also the artists by contributing not just to the, through his or her art to the creation of a new system, uh, but uh, um, through his or her own talents. Yes. Because you, you, again, you have talents that you are applying to therapy. Yeah. And, and, and so, and we are, we are so rich of talents that we need to, to, to start to, uh, to apply and, you know, when, and, and make that relevant, that yes. relationship, right? Uh, that uh, is uh, also one of the themes that I hear from uh, everyone. Uh, they want to separate us, or so this coronavirus has kind of uh, isolated us because you are in your home, I am in my home, and uh, many others are kind of is isolated. But we are persisting there because you and I are talking, <laughs> you know? And yes. actually, this what I found, this relationship, is more direct. Although yes. I, miss, I would love to be, to have a copy with you and have you yes. right here. Yes. But we, I got this, I got part of you. So visually I can read only your head, part of your shoulders. Yeah. And read your background, but I am really pretty focused. So I noticed that my conversations are of higher quality. And at the end of every conversation, I'm tired. Mentally and absolutely excited and excited. Absolutely. So absolutely it's nice to be coming together. So you are doing a project called the Theater of Now. Yes. That's how um, I said I, I saw your interview with Roberta and I said, Oh, I, I really need to, to talk to her. <laughs> Can you tell, you tell us more about this project? Uh it is um coming from what something that you said, uh you said like you know, like 
coronavirus came and then we are separated and then but I I be able to see you and focus on you like yes or another way of seeing it that I see it is like coronavirus show us that we were not connected even though we were physically connected before huh. so we were not be able to do it uh, so how and I know we are very hesitant you and I I feel it from you but I am hesitant to say anything positive about coronavirus because we are talking about people dying and lives being destroyed um, but I, I don't know if it's positive or negative. What I'm saying is it is an opportunity. It is an opportunity to realize that what we had before was a marriage being made of convenience. So now let's try to make a marriage made based on love. Let's connect <laughs> with, with our audience. And let's connect with our people. It's not convenient that you want to forget about your life and you're going to see me acting and dancing. No, now, now let's make a connection and a marriage based on love in the understanding that I am everything. I'm, I'm all the characters. And you are all the characters. Uh, so the theater of now is the way how I kind of, uh, the, the line is very simple. It's what we were talking at the beginning, how we can use the tools of the, of the performing arts into the mental and emotional wellness for everybody. You don't have to be an actor. I believe that actors and performers, um, for me, <laughs> actors and performers are at the, the, we are, when we are really working into this, we really, touch higher levels of a spiritual level. We are always our creativity. It is like in a realm that not everybody can touch, can see it. I always remember that metaphor that Grotowski uses as a, I think a, an actor in a play is kind of like a, he's in an elevator and the, the audience arrive and you, you press the button so you take them to different places. I believe more like Grotowski was saying, we are like in a basket and we are pulling the rope and then we go to a place and then we come back and talk to the audience and say what we saw. I think that we as, uh, as a performers, we, we have through our work in anonymous ways. The paratheater para of Grotowski was totally anonymous. It was in reaction to the martial law. And he said, yeah, well, okay, you, cannot, you can control my performances, but you cannot control my rehearsal space. And then anonymously found that. So I found that connection when anonymously, um, I, I tell this story, but it, it's very nice. Like I was doing a simple improv with my kids. They are 20 young adults with severe uh, mental health uh, disorders. And the, the instruction was simple. Boss is an improv. Boss, an employee. And the boss is going to give a piece of paper to the employee. And it's going to say, you want to pretend that it's the newspaper. And it's going to say, I know everything. And then after that improvisation happens, it's simple. Well, one of my, my students says, last night, I learned how to read. This morning, I read the newspaper, and now I know everything. So he was be able to give a connection and to give a space to the improv that it takes an actor a higher level to it. So when I, am, when I see a kid who is uh, having a delusion moment, and I am talking to a, a kid that is telling me, uh, that person that you think I am, I am not. It's in the back of my head. You are talking now to this other personality. And then for me to start talking to this new personality, try to disengage the personality, the attach, to try to the person come back. Or when somebody is really thinking that he has a hole in the back of the head, and th there, is, there is ways that I can say, no, you don't have a hole in the back of your head. It's, no, I do have it. So I cannot have it by, I cannot work with this person based in intellectual concepts. I got to say, hey, have you seen the sun? Have you seen the colors? Have you seen the... The motion. So I've been discovering in this crossroad that there is some tools of the emotional world, the narratives of what we have in ourselves, the characters that we have created in ourselves. And that has met with um, the understanding. And there's a lot of like work of like, Eckhart Tolle. Eckhart Tolle brought the, the topic of power of now. And I think it's extremely valuable. Uh, and he sees like this pain body as a collective thoughts. And then I'm thinking, oh yeah, sometimes when I think I'm gonna do a show, I'm thinking, oh, what Roberto is gonna think about it? Or oh, Roberto is gonna not like that. Oh, and then I create all, oh, I'm stopping myself in my mind. So I think I did the theater of now thinking in the performer, thinking in the mental health of the performer, thinking the performer right now is feeling trapped, isolated, without a master, uh, with a body and, an, and a spirit that is able, but not be able to make it work. Somebody has to talk about the mental health of the performer, but nobody talks. We don't talk about it because we tough it up. You are an artist. You tough it up. You're resilient. You do it. So theater of now was to say, 
you have all this sensitivity, all these connections. Let's take us a moment and let's talk about you right now because you are the result of your present time. And theater, because it's all the elements of the performing arts. And I do believe that that investigation can extend to anybody in different language. Then maybe if, if we take care of the artist, like who we are taking care of the nurses and the doctors, or hopefully, I don't think we are, but like let's say in the theoric world, we are taking care of them, then that artist can become a part of that virus and it can spread and then it becomes a moment of transformation. If we abandon the artist and we don't give them the chance to work in their mental health as much as they work in the capacity of doing handstands, react organically to the body, we never talk about the mental health of the performing arts in my experience. So that, ergo, the theater of now. Theater of now is basically that crossroad in between the work that I'm doing. And I have to bring a lot, and I don't want to go extending this, Roberto, I'm sorry, I'm passionate about it. But um, yes. me, it myself, I would never imagine <laughs> I was doing theater. What? A theater, no, a therapy in theater. I'm saying, no, therapy is outside. Therapy happens outside of the work in a space. The work in a space is the work in a space. And now coronavirus happened. And guess what? I don't have a work in a space. Now the work in a space is everywhere. Now the characters are everywhere. Now the props are my home and the, the things in my home. So um, the theater of now is an invitation for the, for the artists to take care of their mental health, to try to meet so far with me um, and to try to understand, hey, I'm feeling this way. I'm doing this. This is the place that I am. This is working. This is not working for me anymore because that's the path that I, that I have. And then hopefully from that, that performer will talk to another human being and say, you know what? I was feeling fear too. And this sucks. But you know what? You don't have to react to your fear. You can react to a small thing here that you do and you start breaking that system until that this spreads. That's the theater of now. Oh, that's so magnificent. Uh, that's wonderful. And so thank, thank, you, you, thank you for doing this and that uh, for bringing that up and pointing the, <coughs> to this, uh, this challenge because you are right. We rarely talk about the mental health of the artist. We assume at times, and here I'm improvising or instinctually reacting, we're assuming uh, that artists should be mentally unstable to create mm -hmm. art. And that's just not true. Right. No, it's not true. And we go, and we, if we go in a scene and somebody in the in the in the rehearsal say um, or apparently something to a trauma, because that's the thing of mental health. Unless you are the psychotic guy who is outside throwing rocks to a bank, you think that everybody's fine. Well, guess what? Everybody's buttoning it up. Everybody has stories of trauma. Everybody has problems of validation. And sometimes appears in the working space. We don't know what to do it. We applaud it. Wow, that, you reach a very important moment there. And we are not going to talk anymore about it. And we are just going to ignore it. And then when the performer derails and goes into um, uh, addiction, uh, oh, that person is weak. We do that. We, we don't take care of our people. And, and then we continue. Because that's the part that we as a society, we don't want to talk about it. We don't know what to do with it. So as soon as, <clears throat> I'm sorry, um, we, I mean, I'm sure we, you can talk about this uh, all day long. Yeah. Uh, but just to close our conversation um, with uh, your experience and with what you just have um, sh um, shared with us, what um, advice would you give to the artist that is now finding herself in the house with, uh, with the, the income that has been um, cut to, to nothing probably, uh, and this also need, and this impossibility to create also, what kind of advice would you give um, us? I am, um, I'm very happy talking to you. When I met Roberta, when I met other artists, um, when I finally put myself to don't procrastinate and do a video, but the gaps in between are very difficult for me. Like I talk to you right now, and you, as you said, is mentally, emotionally investment. I, I hear you. I was talking to Mario Vagini the other day. We talked like for two days, trying to you know, have a conversation. 
and it's like I feel all day, I feel like, oh my gosh, like I, I, I feel tired. Um, so there is part of that, but I have noticing that in the gaps in between my connections, like I talked to you, Roberto, and it will not be strange for me, like in an hour, I am sitting down in my living room like this, thinking, what are we gonna do? Now we're gonna drive to Miami, and um, like in a zombie apocalypse, I'm gonna be driving a car with my three daughters and my wife, and where I'm gonna stop, and we need to take care of those gaps. Because I think that we have, or I have realized that with the coronavirus and all of that, I fell as an artist when I was performing, when I was connecting, forgetting those gaps show me that it never really did connect with my inner me in the sense of that multiplicity of characters that I am and my spiritual sense. My advice is like to don't forget that the artist, the root of the artist is there's a humanity root. That humanity is a very complex um, collective of energy, of thoughts, of feelings. When those has gaps happen, and if we are feeling like, just wait a moment, just look at the window, look at a color, look at a nature, try to break the train of thoughts, because this, those thoughts can take you to self-destruction. And the first thing that those thoughts are going to try to make you feel is that you are irrelevant, this is never going to change, and you are unworth it. And each one of us, we are complete. We are the cosmos. We are connected. It is abstract, but it's not abstract. In moments of difficulty, those gaps in between those moments of connection is those moments that we start to need to high, high level of connection with ourselves. And be patient. Be patient. We can do this. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, please keep uh, sharing these uh, thoughts with us all, and uh, and uh, let's keep in touch. Let's do that.